That's love. What? That movie was just on. <laughs> <laughs> Do the dance. Just a little bit. Go on now, go. Walk out the door. <laughs> And that's how we're starting our conversation <laughs> on racism today. Okay. All right. We All right. Survived it. So, good day, pioneers. Good on day. This day. Which is designated as a celebration of independence for America, we right. continue the conversation about how Black people still do not feel free within this country. Yes. And we'll be doing this using the text entitled White Fragility, written by Dr. Robin D'Angelo. And the <laughs> leading educators on this conversation are Candace Wilson, I messed this up last time, to <laughs> right there. There she yes. is. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Monique Taylor Gibbs. Good afternoon. And Latanya Manson. Good afternoon. So chapter five is called The Good Bad Binary. And I'll be honest, I wanted to look the word up just to make sure I understood what I believe she was saying. And the definition for binary is relating to, composed of, or involving two things. And we see this all the time. So um, one of the quotes that Dr. D'Angelo makes is, I am not a racist, so it is not my problem. Mm, yes. Okay. So we, we see this all the time um, with folks wanting to be um, neutral. But then on a day like today, the fact that I have the African flag behind me and I have on the African, the colors of the African flag will enrage quite a few people who feel like this is um, not patriotic on my part. Mm -hmm. And it takes me to Colin Kaepernick with the kneeling and how that was just so, it caused so much rage for so many white folks. And the binary is, these are the same folks who felt like they weren't racist, so it wasn't their problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, Go ahead. That stuck out to me when you said that is how patriotic racism can She keeps freezing. Or pointing out racism or doing anti-racist things, you all... TG. Yes. You keep going in and out. I, I don't... Yeah, a couple of you are frozen on my end, too. But can you hear me now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I was saying is, um, it's ironic how racism can be identified as patriotic in america right but anything that's against racism or calling out racism or um addressing the consequences of racism you're automatically seen as not being patriotic right <laughs> well i'm gonna have to say too um um uh, anything that goes that goes against, I mean, I think um, what kind of resonates is the same thing like consistently that they're not really willing to listen. You know, so anything that goes against what the, um, the powers to be think is considered racist or not patriotic or you're not in alignment with what the rest of the country is doing that the expectation is that um you know we know that they are in power so we therefore should follow 
what they say. It's almost like we shouldn't have um, we shouldn't have our own voice. We should just go along. So I'm not sure. Yes, it's um, interesting because racism is alive and well. In this same chapter, it talks about the study of 283 white children mm -hmm. and um, who they would give the money to. And it reminds me of the doll test mm -hmm. where yeah. children are given the black doll and the white doll and 80% of the time and upwards, they choose the white doll. Mm -hmm. And so we see where it's still alive and well, but um, I think the idea is like, well, I didn't step on somebody's neck. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'm not a bad person. Also, did you um, know what well, I thought was um, pretty profound too in that same study? Um, that the children seem to, um, the younger group had a different perspective mm -hmm. and then the older um, uh, children had a different perspective. And then you saw the difference of when an adult was present, when an adult wasn't present, mm -hmm. what the reaction was between the two groups, how they would react. Another thing that stuck out to me in that same section was um, on page 85, it says racial, racial hostility in white children is a, a present as young as three years old. Mm -hmm. That like, and I'm, I'm thinking, I'm just thinking back to, you know, things that I've seen where, you know, you see the kid, I don't want to play. I'm sorry, y'all. Something just happened in my, oh, I'm sorry. Sure. And then you get the parents saying, well, I taught, I teach my children not to see color, but they still see it. Or like even myself as a black woman, when I'm in, you know, stores, I can, I can tell when a child has never seen or been around a person, you know, of a different race. It's just because they're like thoroughly intrigued in the reaction. And, you know, um, I even had an incident where the little girl was like staring at me with pure intrigue. And, you know, I'm an educator. So, hi, hi, sweetie. And her mom just kind of like rushed her off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, and I think, I think this is a chapter, I think I circled it or I wrote notes where one of the hardest things, especially um, me in my new position, is just being seen, right? and seen and viewed and valued as much as my counterparts. And I didn't realize how much that um, this good, bad binary affected that not being seen, right? Because the thought on the other, or the thought in my mind that they go through is, well, I wasn't rude to her, I just ignored her, right? Or I just, uh, you know, pacified and acted like I'm listening to her but I just didn't really, you know, I didn't do anything racist. This is just how I behave. And, you know, it's, 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 when you, when you frame racism as good versus bad, I think it allows society to ignore the foundation and effect of the, the consequence of racism. Right. And then trying to bury it by not talking about it. So it was actually chapter two where the, an example of just what you said, um, Monique, was, mm -hmm. it was given where they're in the grocery store and mm -hmm. the little child is in the cart and says, mommy, look at that person, that black person. And the mom mm -hmm. goes, shh, 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 we don't see mm -hmm. you. As if there's mm -hmm. something wrong with being black. But mm -hmm. why is there that need to shush someone, a child um, who's just recognizing a difference from what Absolutely. they see? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I've had an, an experience in my classroom where I've said, um, when we talk, we're, when we're talking about race and we're talking about um, some of what happened during civil rights, I said, if someone came down our hallway right now and they were orange, we would look, we, mm -hmm. we, we would want to know what's going on, you know, right. that would be different. 
Um, and it would be more, they'd be more inclined to be like, why are you orange? <laughs> because because okay. it's pure heart. Mm -hmm. We would be standing there like, hello, how are you? Trying to be kind. Right. But all the while wondering, why is this are they? Right. orange? Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think one of the challenges for me in reading this is recognizing how much of it has been imposed upon me and my thought process right as well mm -hmm. like it's ingrained in my pores and i don't like it but i would but that's how i would handle it you know so as we have this conversation and we identify what's wrong with our system i want us to be really um cognizant of where we can see those same traits in us because we're <laughs> part of this society we've right been indoctrinated by this society and how can we shift our thinking because uh as candace said you know we have lots of people all around us like white folks wanting to know how can i fix it how can i fix it mm -hmm. so you know these conversations breaking it down like this is what it is this is this we we have to start to bring solutions beyond mm -hmm. just naming the but, but she also what what continues it seems like um the consistent thread is the consistent thread is that um this is one woman or one of of, of several um that have brought this um to our attention but my question keep or i keep asking myself as i'm constantly reading when we talk about solutions because i'm all about solutions but if you if we're having issues in getting just to come to the table to um address like moving forward i'll give for an example i mean i think she she talks about it um throughout the book too and um even this chapter where you know she's asked to come in these corporations mm -hmm. and 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 on the lines of diversity and it kind of drew me back to my 11 years in corporate america where we had someone come in and talk about um diversity issues it was a white male and it was I mean, the guy was really resonating, but the employees, unfortunately, and I was in a department where I was the only black, only female, all white male. So t just the little snippets that he would give um, cause um, went from denial to I'm not racist. Mm -hmm. to I don't understand why we talking about this I mean we had people storming out and mm -hmm. here we sitting I'm sitting here going wait a minute you guys are the dynamics I'm mm -hmm. the only black and female in the department so it's the same thing um we're talking about it but how can we because there's just so sensitive on the issue um I don't know. I think I, I think what you said, Heather, um, last week was this. This is a start, but it just as as I'm reading, it's like okay, it's a start, but we have to start getting to the solutions if we want to be able to understand each other um, better. I think on if you on page seventy two, um, she picked. She picked the occurrences apart perfectly, in my opinion, with a with a sociological view, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. so um, on page 72, she says, within this paradigm, to suggest that I'm racist is to del deliver a deep moral blow, mm -hmm. the character assassination. Mm -hmm. Having received this blow, I must then defend my character. And mm -hmm. that is where my energy will grow to deflecting the charge rather than reflecting on my behavior. And so then in the next paragraph, um, she says, for most whites, however, racism is like murder. The concept exists, but someone has to commit it in order for it to happen. So I mm -hmm. think I really looked at this section right here as like, like arming ourselves with information, right? Because, you know, now we have the Karens, the Kevins, 
um, permit patties. And everyone is like, well, why do they think it's their business? And so this shines a light on that because for them to just might be um, walking into waters where A, it isn't my business. B, I might be reacting to a situation because I'm white and this person is black. This just picked apart, the, this just gives us the why, right? Because yeah. they would rather defend themselves yes. than to then identify, okay, I'm only addressing this issue with you or I'm only bringing this up or I'm only all up in your space, all up in your bubble because you don't look like me and you are different and I have a bias against that. Mm -hmm. and, and everyone just led with that, that's, that's the starting point right there. But we have, now we know that after reading this chapter, the initial concept is to defend instead yes. of understanding. Mm -hmm. So I, I, think, I think that's the point where we start no matter what your race is you know for us as you know black women to understand that this is how this happens or why this happens and then you know for white people to understand that th this this is what right and so you know the it, we call them courageous conversations like you're not mm -hmm. you're not mad because i'm out here doing x y and z you're mad because i pointed out that you're mad that i'm out here you know, and now you're bothering me. So you're not mm -hmm. mad that I'm actually, do, you know, that I'm doing it. You're just mad that How I'm, dare I'm you? outside How of dare your you? yes. realm of mm -hmm. expectation and you feel the supremacy and the right to address me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So let's mm -hmm. go right into chapter five because that supremacy that you talked about. Um, I'm sorry, not chapter five, chapter six, six. Is entitled anti-blackness mm. and it's the relentless messages of black inferiority yes. that cause whites to feel superior. So what are some of those messages? Blacks are lazy, blacks mm -hmm. are dangerous, mm -hmm. um, we're criticized more harshly. Um, mm -hmm. They're childlike. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, information, fables, lies, mm -hmm. guilt. These ideas are rooted in misinformation, fables, lies, and deep guilt. But it, re it saves their sense of moral trauma. It keeps them, the collective white consciousness keeps mm -hmm. them from the moral trauma that would come if they ever had to admit um, what they're capable of inflicting, mm -hmm. which is immeasurable harm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that their gains are earned by the subjugation of others. Yes. On page 91, it sums up the whole chapter. Anti-Blackness is foundational to our very identities as white people. And to admit that. Yes is suicide. So then we have to Absolutely. do everything we can to keep this um, white consciousness sacred. Mm -hmm. While we suffer, I know it was um, mentioned in an earlier chapter about the psychic drain that it causes us as mm -hmm. black people. And um, Manson, you alluded to it when you came to the school that we worked at together. Mm -hmm. and the conversations that would take place and you were just kind of like okay i'm gonna let you be because it is draining like we we can engage and i know i have i'm sure you have at points mm -hmm. you engage but then at the end of the day you realize you still have to go home take care of your family yeah. right your bills have to be paid and mm -hmm. the amount of drain that it causes trying to explain someone what you mm -hmm. to someone what you've been through whether they caused it or not right they don't get it they don't understand they just feel like um well it wasn't me or i don't do things like that and oh well so it's 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 like <laughs> i say it's like trying to teach somebody one plus one is two and they just will not no matter how many what manipulatives you give them no how many um pictures you show them 
using their fingers, their hand, it doesn't matter. They're still not getting it. They're not getting it. And so like, it's very draining. You just be like, you know what? I'm gonna let you be great. And you go ahead and be great. And you're going to come across somebody that is not going to be like me. There might be a little bit harsh or things like that. Cause it is, it's, it's very draining. It's just like, I don't feel like it today. You got to be in the mood. I'm mm-hmm. going to say that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I think, said, um, I think the other piece is they really don't want to. Mm-mm. They don't want to. They're comfortable in their space. They're comfortable in their privilege. They really don't want to. And because they see us as some of the things that she pointed out that we're mundane, um, you know, oh, they're just here on quota. They really don't want to, you mm-hmm. know. Um, and I think I said something last week. I love that we're having this conversation, but at some point in time, they're going to have to honestly join the table and, and be honest and come. Because anything that is, is, is good, um, it's going to be hard. So we're not saying it's not, it's going to be hard. And then even um, some of these things we're reading, um, we can take and use for ourselves. But personally, I just believe they don't want to. They don't, they don't want to. They don't care. We're superior. That's your problem. It's not ours. So why should I even take the time to um, understand um, what you're going through or what or, or trying to explain. Cause I don't know how many times I've had the conversation just like you guys have, but I always come across as, um, and now not finding out that, uh, you know, uh, particularly to the uh, white females, you know, I'm angry, the angry black woman. She, she hurt my feeling. I mean, so, um, all we can do is, is is the best we can. I just think it would be better served if we're just open and have the honest conversation. Like just I you had know a girlfriend, um, y'all might know her, um, because Lori is everywhere. Um, Lori Hayes. I had her, she and her son during the beginning when they were doing um protests uh, um for George Floyd, she takes her sons out on field trips and talks about different situations and things that's going on. And she was saying on one of her um, lives that, you know, she went to a predominantly white school and, you know, it was only about five or six black people in the school and that she never, she felt like she had white friends and they they felt like they were her friends. She said, but they never came to her birthday party and she never came to theirs. Mm -hmm. And so she was like, but I had to think about it. I never invited them and they never invited me. So what she did was, um, somebody that she went to high school with was on her live and she had seen his name on there and she was like, Hey, um, my birthday is next week and I'm inviting you to my party and we're going to go on live and things like that. So she had a conversation with him and they, op- and they talked with each other on live and you can see mm-hmm. it and she's asking him questions. He's asking her and he's like, listen, I didn't even, he said, I look back now. He said, I ain't even paying no mind. He said, I didn't think about it. He was like, but I'm looking and I'm mm-hmm. like, yo, that was wrong. We, we shouldn't have did those things or we shouldn't have. He said, I, I, I remember when we were in the cafeteria and y'all all sat together. Mm-hmm. It was like, and it was like, we never understood why y'all sat together, but we knew we didn't want y'all over here with us, but we would still speak to y'all mm-hmm. and things like that. So she, that was a conversation that I was like, wow. I'm, that was one conversation that I seen that was open. Like everybody was, mm-hmm. he was engaged in the conversation. He understood his part. She understood her part, and they were able to talk and have a good dialogue about it. But I like uh, that. And I, uh, oh. go ahead. I was I was just going to say I I think that it is important that we open the conversation mm-hmm. and and start start talking cross culturally. But I think mm-hmm. that it's it's good to talk amongst a group too. So we are yes. heterogeneous genius group starting a conversation, and it, yes. it definitely needs to branch out. Mm-hmm. TG. I was just going to say that I think in my adulthood, recognizing all of this is, it's, 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 it's tiring. Um, it's traumatizing. Mm-hmm. Um, I just, I've been getting messages from former students and, you know, people in the community who are like awaiting me to c- comment on the um, strand on IG where students 
in Delaware public schools, charter schools, and private schools are now revealing their episodes of racism. And, you know, I've just had to be quite honest. We exist in a society where, and I've said this to my coworkers, my white coworkers, I am always Black, right? I always yeah. have to, I might get emotional, but I always have to exist in my Blackness. Mm -hmm. I always have to second guess myself. We are conditioned to go and fit into spaces that were not built for us, that were not, you know, um, made for us. So we are always expected to go and have seats at these tables um, and speak up and, and, and be representative when a lot of times it does fall on deaf ears. And what we see taking place in society now is 100% what we just read about in the book. You know, you can paint, I think I saw a meme that said, yeah, you can paint Black Lives Matter on streets. You can sing the Negro National Anthem at the football games. You can change your uh, website to the Black Fist. But at the end of the day, if we're not addressing the fact that black and brown people are being killed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and racism is still the foundation, all you're doing is offering me a pacifier. And I think, you know, we've become, we're starting to become conditioned with the pacification as well. Mm -hmm. And so when we get invited into these spaces and, you know, Candace, I'm right with you. As soon as my voice comes up a little bit, you know, I've been called too passionate. Mm -hmm. I've been called an angry black woman. Yes. Anytime you say something that's not, you know, that's outside of the line. Yes. Then they quickly identify, they identify that as an attribute of your race. But as soon as you point out something that is racially motivated or racist yes. in nature. Yes. Then it's passed off. And I even wrote it down in a book. Um, a lot of times race, racism and episodes of racial occurrences are passed off as, oh, well, he just misunderstood you, or that's yes. not really what mm -hmm. they meant. Mm -hmm. See, they didn't say that because you were Black. They said that because you were angry. No, no, no. Exactly. And, and, and it's just like, and, and, and I think the biggest piece of understanding is white society does not understand how traumatizing it is simply to exist among their norms. Like this is a every, this is more than a every day. This is a every second consequence down to the outfits that I wear to work. You know, what my hair looks like today. Can, my earrings, are they too big? Am I too loud? And you know, just to be, you know, there, there have been some times when, you know, even me as a new school leader, I'm like, you know what? Put me back in my bubble in the classroom because I just, I just want to be me. But that's the, that's where I'm, struggling well i won't say struggling but now they they they're gonna get tg <laughs> all of her right and so i think you know when we look at the good bad binary and we look at anti-blackness we really really just need to call on the carpet everything that is being done today to perpetuate this uh anti-black platform Mm -hmm. yes. But let's call a couple more things to the carpet before we move to chapter seven. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, commentator slamming black NFL players for taking a knee, mm -hmm. for being ungrateful. Mm -hmm. So yes. there's this whole idea within the white righteousness framework that mm -hmm. they've done us a favor. Right? Yep. So yep. the movie, The Blind Side, uh, oh, where the white folks come and save the day, save him from his awful neighborhood. Mm -hmm. and I feel like the Lord called me to mm -hmm. save this Negro. Okay. Uh, it's from his poor, Joe, unfortunate self. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Congressman <laughs> Joe Walsh declares that Stevie Wonder is another ungrateful black multi- Yes. As, mm -hmm. Because it's, it's as if we're given permission to exist in our excellence. Right. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. which, mm -hmm. which goes to the Carol Anderson assertion. She's written a book called White Rage, where she asserts that um, what whites are really mad about is black advancement. Yep. 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 It, at any level. We're out of any level. 
we're out of our place. Yes. Mm -hmm. And how dare you, you uppity black, to think that mm -hmm. you should um, acquire? I, I, I'm gonna have to say this: that um, a lot of the stuff that she writes about, I, I think it's great. But again, I'm gonna just have to say I am grateful for my upbringing. I am grateful for just my parents and stealing in me and telling me, hey, you're great, you're beautiful, you don't have to change. Um, uh, of recent where we constantly have to worry about our hair. I'm seriously, honestly, I've said this, <laughs> I'm not afraid to lose a job. And if the job has issues with my hair, then so be it, it wasn't meant to be. But that, that whole concept of, of changing around and, and, mm -hmm. and, and fixing my clothes and being acceptable, as far as I'm concerned, and I've said this several times, what you see is exactly what you get. Mm -hmm. And then going down the line, education, all of that stuff that um, I said that we are destined for greatness, we are great. Um, I wish I would. I don't even know how to. And that's probably why, and I'm fine with it. It's mm -hmm. probably why in my um, journey of working and, and moving around, I probably could have acquired more, but I'm sorry. I love the skin I'm in and um, the society in which it is built, you know, um, like um, Monique said earlier, that it is not designed for us. So we know it's not designed for us. So why not continue to move in our greatness? Because we've forgotten who we are. And I really yeah. want to speak, I really yes. want to speak to this piece. Um, again, like you were saying, uh, TG, about the conditioning. And I had spoken mm -hmm. to it early, uh, earlier. I want us to be super, super careful moving forward. Because if tables were to turn in a blink of an eye today and Blacks were put in power, would we be any different? I was watching an episode of The Shy, you know, with all this time, you know, you can binge watching some things that you hadn't had a chance to see. And um, very much like The Wire years ago, it, it shows some group dynamics within gangs. And they're mean to one another. Yes. It's like as soon as one gang member is shot down and killed, and, you know, I, my heart was going out to that one because I thought he was being mistreated, but now he's in power and he's mistreating mm -hmm. his um, subjugates. So, but we've been taught that from our slave master. I was, I was ready to say, this is what mm -hmm. we've been taught. Mm -hmm. Okay, Absolutely. so we, we need to really construct this new world, one conversation at a time, one idea at a time, so that we don't mm -hmm. repeat that yes. which is taught to us, mm -hmm. the behavior of the oppressor. And you don't mm -hmm. know until you know. Like, I didn't know. I didn't know how much I was stifling myself until I heard myself say it. And then um, it was literally one morning I was getting dressed for work. And I literally went, like, through three outfits. And I had to say, stop. I'm going to wear this outfit. And this is what I want to wear. And they're going to take it in. And But, but you, you have to... You have to be offered that moment of self-reflection, right? So many mm -hmm. times, a lot of us are like on this, on this COVID for me could have been the best thing to happen just for the fact that I had a second to pause. Mm -hmm. And I think that's mm -hmm. what happened for everyone. And that's, yes. I, I, this, this great awakening would not have happened without this pandemic going on. In my, in my this is my personal opinion, because yeah. We see things that happen, right? We make our comments, we sign our petitions or whatever, but we got to go to work the next day. So we're not doing too much, right? And so it was a perfect storm for a lot of people to realize and sit back and reflect. Because honestly, after March 13th, that the, those two weeks, when we were all kind of stuck in limbo because school was closed, but there wasn't necessarily any remote learning going on, that was a time of reflection. So we have had nothing but time on our hands. Mm -hmm. And so until I had that time, did I realize like, 
okay, you, you need a self check. Right. And, mm -hmm. and, and because a lot of times too, when we're working and moving and shaking and, you know, we work and then we got the kids going here, there and everywhere after school. And if your kids are older, like, you know, Manson and my, you know, like ours are, mm -hmm. we're not necessarily engaging with the kids after school, but we're engaging with other people's kids after school. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, you know, just that constant movement, movement, movement. It was like somebody literally held a mirror up and was like, okay, I need all y'all to check yourselves. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I say it was divine dimension. Divine dimension had to intervene to settle, to settle us all. And if you have taken advantage, I mean, if you were smart, you've taken advantage of this time to reflect with yourselves, with your families, and and kind of like as Heather said, like a reset and really evaluate exactly where you want to go, what you want to do, and moving forward. And I think um, in reading this book, as um, Heather, all of you guys have said, Monique, that um, it's a, a, a reflection too, where we can do some soul searching um, for ourselves, because there were even some things that I was like, mm, I had to take a um, kind of review. Like for instance, when I said something about um, the white women tend to, you know, um, angry black woman, or they're crying, and I imitated how and which. Mm -hmm. Now that is a is a way in which, and I think she speaks about one of those examples. I forget yeah. what chapter it was yeah. mm -hmm. of how the white woman explained it. <laughs> Everybody knew from the way in which she explained that they were talking right. about this black woman saying, "Hey, my child," and right. just reflecting. I just did the same thing, mm -hmm. um, you know. So we we also have to take into um, take into account of our own actions too, or be mindful at least of what we're doing. Be mindful. I agree because Dr. D'Angelo is a sociologist. Yes, and right. by nature they study human relations. Mm -hmm. You know, like we're we're living it day to day, but they take the time to sit back and study it. Right. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of that is that you can get to the, you can drill down to the common threads that have nothing to do with black or white. It it it, it could be pink or purple, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, it started with greed. Yes. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. um, trying to acquire things. So where where does greed come from? And then needing to create fear. Mm -hmm. and, and these bigger ideas, um, competition, mm -hmm. the need for competition, we see it everywhere. We love it when it's football, but you know, it's like test scores and mm -hmm. it's just everywhere. The, the, the need to, to be better than someone. And I worry, I feel like, so going into chapter seven, where it talks about racial triggers for white folks, and the fact that they see it as their birthright, they're taught that. But we go, yeah. to kinder we go to kindergarten and we're taught that this is green, you know, this is green, yeah. this is black, this is red, mm -hmm. and you are superior as a white person. It's just mm -hmm. what we're taught. So I don't have issues with individual white folks per se. Some, yes, because they know what they're doing, Mm -hmm. And they are um, purposefully and intentionally continuing on this crusade that was ridiculous from the start. Mm -hmm. We've mm -hmm. all been bamboozled. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to continue to yeah. keep that narrative going, then you're my enemy for sure. But the rest, you were just taught green, black, red, red. and white is supreme. You were taught that. Mm -hmm. You didn't mean me no harm. Somebody just taught you that. Right. Mm -hmm. And now we're working to unteach that. Mm -hmm. That's what this conversation is about. No, you mm -hmm. are not better than me. By birth, we are absolutely equal. And right. I'm fitting to show exactly. you to treat me equally. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm going to say this on the day that America is celebrating uh, Independence Day and having served my time in the military. Um, it, it kind of coincides where some people, um, 
for I have said that during my tenure in the military, I honestly, really, uh, oh, I saw a direct contrast between America and Europe, having, having to spend um, 18 months in Germany. And honestly, I say this honestly, and I've said this before, that the way in which Blacks were treated, um, or at least in my opinion, the way in which I was treated in Germany was a little bit taken back because it was almost like you went from here, this country where I'm serving and I'm in another country where I'm treated with absolutely respect, royalty. Like it was almost like jarring at times that I'm like, what, where am I? What, what are we doing? So um, my three years, seriously, three years in the military, I saw little, very little of racism. One, we didn't have the time. We didn't have the time to figure out, um, you know, hey, he's white over there and I'm black and he's Asian. We didn't have the time. We had work to do. We, had, we needed to work together as a team to accomplish a mission. And that's what we did. And then you come back, you know, having to come back, um, and then finding out, okay, here, here we go again. Here we go, Candace, make an adjustment because you just spent 18 months. I mean, you're in Germany, you're taking your time over there in France and all these other exciting places. And then you come back and spend your last, and it's like, wow, okay. You know, you have to um, um, adjust, so to speak. So I just wanted to mention that. Mm -hmm. And I'm here, I wonder, I've, I've, I've felt like that before in certain settings too, but maybe we just weren't thinking racially in those <laughs> moments. If given, given time to really think through certain conversations, I'm sure you could point out some things, but you're not alone in that. I have felt that way. And I had a conversation with my son just recently. He, his best friend is white. And I was just wondering like, well, what's your conversation been like? in this time period because i see him on instagram posting some um racial racial black pride kinds of posts and what what do your friends who are primarily white think and he's like well we just don't we just don't care we just don't care about race now mm -hmm. meanwhile he's been raised in a very cultural family you know <laughs> mm -hmm. yes right. um cultural pride is definitely a part of our experience here but he says they don't care about it. And I've heard that over and over. I've, mm -hmm. I've seen it in some ways in the children that I teach. You know, when mm -hmm. I go into my Martin Luther King civil rights, they get so charged. Like, why? Mm -hmm. Why do they act like that? You know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I mean, tears. Like, if I couldn't sit next to my friends, you know, so and so, mm -hmm. I would just, it wouldn't be right. I can't believe people acted like that. And right. so we see that binary as well, where it's not all, this is not black and white. Like there are, there are so many shades to this experience. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's true. And that leads into like exactly in reading all of this, you know, the number one place I spent most of my time is the school right and so mm -hmm. now taking all of these chapters and it's pointed out on page page uh, 105 right um, how does all of this look in a school and the incident that's recorded on page 105 um, where the student felt disrespected by the way the teacher spoke to them. Oh, yes. It goes, it goes right back to white fragility in the lens of a teacher where mm -hmm. the teacher is unable, their intentions become more important than the impact that the action actually had, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And so because I didn't, I didn't mean to say it and I didn't mean for it to feel that way, you shouldn't feel that way. Mm -hmm. And so there was an incident that occurred at a school where I was working where um, something was said about another student. The teacher said something about the student's hair. 
the student being, you know, not knowing how to address that with the teacher, because again, we've created this dynamic where our, our kids are not allowed to speak up because they're automatically seen as defiant, disrespectful, you might earn a consequence, a write-up, right? So the parent of that student reached out to me because they knew that I could be a voice for that student. And when I when I brought it up to the school leader, the first thing that came out was, well, she I don't think she meant it like that. And I said, it doesn't matter how she meant it. This is how it was perceived. And so as a person who is not of the same race, you it's just things you can't say. Mm -hmm. And she needs to understand mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And the fact that most of the conversation took place between the school leader and I, trying to figure out how to address this mm -hmm. and why it was so hurtful to the student, then the actual person who said it, that that just stood out to me with this with this page right here in this chapter, because too often, you know, teachers say things. And it's just passed passed along as, oh, that's not. Or or depending upon the student they say it to, it's downplayed, right? Oh, you just misunderstood what I no, I understood totally what you said. Don't say it again, right? And so we should be empowering our students, and that's a lot of what I do. Um, and so and and I get that from you know I've I've had people tell me well you're intimidating hmm are you am i intimidating or are you just intimidated because there's a difference yes. and so you know right. we have to we have to empower our children to be able to identify like was i disrespectful or you just feel disrespected because there's a difference and so we have we have to empower our children to be able to be vocal and and you know understand and and just you know not not stand for the status quo of the treatment that they may receive mm -hmm. but um in that same um scenario that she points out in the book the um can, the student wasn't even considered her feelings and thoughts wasn't even considered in the scenario at yeah. all like yeah. none of it at all i felt that it would have probably been best um, suited. And even in the situation that you've explained, have the teacher, the two administrators, and the parent and the student talking so that it comes to, um, you know, comes to an agreement. But it's the same, it's the same thing that is mentioned in the book where defensive, um, deflecting so that you can take away from not really um, address the issue, but deflect onto something else that after a while you continue to talk, you'd have already forgotten what you were talking about. So it's that same um, white privilege. Um, like I said, I just think the, the young lady, her, her feelings weren't even considered at all. It was just like, this is what I said, so you take it and, 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 you know, take it from there. And the other thing I agree with you, TG, is that we do need to, I don't understand why, but um, I, we do need to empower students. I mean, even myself, my son who is in um, Finland, but I've always taught him that your voice is of value. You have a question or a comment, you raise your hand. If it's, um, um, you know, the teacher may have said something to you, as long as you address it respectfully, you know, ask the question respectfully, but don't you dare. If you feel like um, something's wrong that you need to voice it, and if it gets beyond that, then let, you know, let me know, and then I'll, I will intervene. But I agree, we do need to empower students more to um, um, ask questions or, or um, yeah, ask questions about something that they feel is, is, is not right. Because they spend it, they are spending, seven or more hours in school too. Mm -hmm. Agreed. I think we're all going to be having to do far more self-reflection in that area mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. intent versus impact because, um, you know, the flip side of that is for me seeing kids who just seem whiny. Like every time you turn around, their feelings are hurt and they're, they're yes. calling some card. It doesn't even have to be their race card. Yes. Um, 
somebody has offended them. And it's like, mm -hmm. we want, we want people to have um, a thick skin and, and be tough. Like you were saying about, um, was it offensive or were you just offended? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's that fine line there with a lot of that mm -hmm. because I can have my intention all day long. And I know I like to bring humor into the classroom, but maybe I thought I was being funny and someone didn't take it as funny, but I was mm -hmm. in my heart. I have a great heart, you know, a good right. heart. And I didn't mean any harm, but it caused harm. Mm -hmm. Or did it, depending on the person and whether they're- Right, exactly. Someone who's always- complaining about something so mm -hmm. a lot of that is going to be hard to sift through it's not easy <laughs> stuff but i love this line in chapter eight where um dr d'angelo was talking to a group and it was the black man in the group who said it would be revolutionary yes people could re yes. reflect mm -hmm. and work on changing the behaviors perpetuated mm -hmm. by racism yes three things receive reflect and work on you know mm -hmm. receive what we've what we've shared today and reflect on mm -hmm. it and then the work the work's gonna be tough stuff i mean another couple years a couple hundred years from now folks might still be working on it mm -hmm. right but whatever we can do to further the conversation and and i really hope someone receives it today and reflects on it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then begins the work. I find that our students, our the youth of today are very they smart. They they creative with a lot of their mm -hmm. things and things that they do. Um mm -hmm. I thought that what they did for our president's rally was like the utmost. I was like, oh my God, I never even would have thought about doing nothing mm -hmm. like that. Like, yeah. what, Can you explain it? Well, what they did was they all got together. I don't know how they did it, but they got together and they they reserved tickets for his rally. But like they might have reserved, like say everybody reserved 10 tickets and nobody showed up. So that was basic. And you know, he thrives off of numbers. <laughs> you know, everything is the numbers and I got this and I got that. And so the fact <laughs> that, and that was the youth that did that. That wasn't yeah. even... You know us that we didn't think of nothing like that. We didn't. Yep. We just. We just not going. You know what I mean? It's like I'm that not going. started. That started on Instagram. That was the. That was an IG movement. I <laughs> we we watched that unfold, and it was. You know, we fussed at the kids <laughs> being on their phone all the time, and mm -hmm. you know, I know I preached to my son. You use your phone for the right things. Like you have a computer in your hand, and like just to see that unfold, man, son, I was just like. Okay. <laughs> it's like when they I'm used not to so worried about them anymore. <laughs> right. It's That's like weird. when they used to do the flash mobs and they would show up somewhere dancing or something like that, things like that. But then for them to to do that right there, let them know like, yo, you don't really got everybody. You don't have us. And you know what I mean? Don't think right. because we're younger, we don't know. Um, and he should know that as um my girl, what I got was um AOC and um that's her name, right? Yeah, I believe so. In the Senate, where she got um elected from the internet. Mm -hmm. And so it was like she was that's how she like she wasn't known known, but they elected her through it was the internet, everything through the internet, and that's that's what our kids are are known for. So I think that like I just I used to worry about my son a lot, but mm -hmm. when I have conversations with him, I'm like, oh, so you do, you do get it? Oh, you do? Oh, all right. Okay. Like he's, I worry every time he goes out the house, but as far as what, I'm like, when you interact with different people when you, he, the jobs that he works at, cause he has two jobs. I'm like, how does that work? Like, how are you okay with that? Like, is that, do you feel like you're moving up and he's like mom i don't pay them no mind i don't like long as they ain't disrespecting me or saying nothing crazy to me and i'm like but what about your counterparts your colleagues do you say anything when they say something to them and he was like mom everybody in here he said we are all pretty much the same age he was like even our boys might be like two hours two two years older than them and he's like well we we've all had conversations and it's like you know not to say certain things to us 
and we know not to say certain things to you. So we they kind of look at it as think before you talk. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, that's how they look at it. Like think before you say. Before you say it, be like, uh, is this going to be offensive? Am I going to have to say something smart back? How am I? How how is this going to be perceived? And so they the youth writing about now, like they on fire. I like them. They stress me out, but I like them. It's most likely the youth of every age period, because if you think of like civil rights and uh, the mm-hmm. student nonviolent coordinating, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. um, one of those is wrong. I know it's SNCC, mm-hmm. but it, I feel like it's always the youth that take us to that next level because we always, you know, mm-hmm. so I, I'm thankful, I'm appreciative. I think that the song we came into, I Will Survive, is right where we are. Exactly. It's right where we yeah. are. Okay. I just realized too, ladies, all of us have boys for young yes, men. We do. Mm-hmm. We do. All of us, young males. <laughs> God said he didn't want us to have no girls. He said, nah, we weren't ready. Oh, no, absolutely. No, 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 ma'am. <laughs> the Lord knew I could only handle a boy. He only knew that. <laughs> it's a blessing. So, mm-hmm. yes, we will bring uh, chapters 9 through 12 and our concluding remarks next week. But this has been another phenomenal session. I thank yes, you. Yes, ladies. Thank and you. you exactly what we've asked of you, which is to receive, reflect, and then we all together will do the work. Yeah. Yes.